course, I'm Mike Sharman in real life and I'm Mike Sharman on the internet. Can you believe that? <laughs> the same person online as I am in the real world. Fucking incredible. What we're going to talk about today is influencers in general. So I'm from Retroviral and uh, speaking about Alex, this is kind of Alex in a different universe. Three different characters. My branded Cape Town Alex. Okay? And the reason why I talk about her is because I've actually known the different iterations of Alex. No one really knows Alex and they never will do. I mean, we don't even know if Alex is a real name. Okay? But the point of the matter is, is that Alex has been doing this online writing thing for a very long time. And it's actually quite a, quite a relevant and useful segue that she spoke first and now I need to talk. Someone tweeted, who was the person that tweeted about, oh, it's a fight, it's on. Alex is a person, oh, she's gonna kick Mike's ass. Who tweeted that? There we go, there we go, good one. He was trying to win the prize for, for, for phones or fighting and creating online drama. There we go, your point was proven once again. And the interesting thing is like how the internet and specifically the internet in South Africa has evolved from a storytelling point of view from that sarcastic yols and lols and lolcats and there was even a picture of a woman being eaten by a killer whale at one stage I believe. And that persona that Alex was in the online space was very different from that Cape Town girl individual and then finally now in her more representative of her real life in terms of her day job and her novelist life. It's really important that from an influence point of view, understanding, like she said, who the people are that you're engaging. Who are those individuals that are going to be a representation of your brand, especially if they're going to be changing and morphing in such a, a very diverse way. And. Um, I've got the clicker in my pocket, that's what I didn't know. Got a clicker in my pocket. I'm happy to see you. Um, so in terms of 2006 to 2010, so I used to work in traditional comms and PR. So for us and for communicators, as a lot of us in this room I assume we are, the best way to get a message out there is one-to-one. -one. Like that is the most effective way. I can stand up here and say, hello. I have a wonderful brand, and I have uh, great cosmetic properties, and I can make your skin very smooth, and your face so very red. Okay, so that's the best way for a brand to communicate one on one. That's how we're going to sell anything, and that's how we're going to get anything out there. But it's impossible and very expensive to communicate one on one, as we know. How many of you are advertisers or in agencies trying to sell a useless brand to people that they don't want on a daily basis? No, none of you. No one's admitting to that because there's clients in the room. Okay, so the interesting thing is like one-to-one, -one, that's obviously the easiest way. And in the past, when we didn't have social media as a word of mouth property, we had things like journalists, and we had newspapers, and we had TV, and we had radio. And that's what started happening. I worked at an agency in 2006 that actually started inviting bloggers to press events and to come and hear the press releases and the amazing things about technology and what's happening for that specific product or brand or service. And when you think back to the, the time of 2006 to 2010, there were some really interesting characters who are now completely different in the world that they occupy. So Alex spoke about the My Branded Life days and how different she was then. Who here knows the guy who makes socks, Nick Harry? Put your hands up if you know Nick Harry. Did you know that Nick Harry used to have a blog called Essay Rocks and he used to tell positive stories that eventually would close down because positivity doesn't sell. If it bleeds, it leads. That's the old adage, as they say in the print business. That's not even a dodgy thing. He was whistling, Fred. <laughs> so the point is that all of these individuals have kind of morphed and they've, they've transformed into different characters. They've tested out certain things. They've experienced different writing and different features and, and functions of the online space. And I think that's the most important thing for brands to understand is that it's still a relatively new space from a branded content and an information point of view. And brands will open up accounts, they'll create blogs, they'll create Twitter and Facebook and Instagram feeds, and they'll just rush in where angels fear to trade and they'll just put out their message and expect that everything's going to work just perfectly. And that's what doesn't happen. The big example, perfect. I mean, that was like a harmless intention to be like, oh, let's all be so PC and do, 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 do. women are just like men nowadays. And we all know how that good intention led to a very negative experience. 
And that's why brands can't just expect to have evolved into a space where they are, they've nailed their tone of voice and they've nailed the understanding of the consumers. And also the ways in which consumers evolve on a daily basis, we know that, I mean most of us in the room, like we're starting to get to that stage where we're feeling a little bit old. Like, there's things like Snapchat. <laughs> Snapchat, holy shit. I'm like one of the oldest people in my business right now, I'm 32 years old. And I go up and hang out with the 20 year old. So, can you um, teach me how this Snapchat thing works? You know, that is like, that's the reality. I started hanging out and like mystery shopping around my nieces so that I can hear how they interact on social platforms like we don't. And that is the frightening thing about this universe that we, that we engage with and we're incorporated in. So then in 2010, there were all these different characters and all these different individuals and an interesting thing happened in 2010 and this is a story that actually relates back to Alex's iteration of Cape Town Girl. So this slide is called Zami Namina Nandos. Okay? Because in 2010, you know what the vibe was? Like, what is that? Vibe? Okay? And then there was the whole like, World Cup and Samina Mina, eh eh, waka waka, eh eh. <laughs> and the hip movement. It's time for Africa, Samina Mina, okay? So, we launched Retro Viral in 2010 after I've been working in the UK for a couple of years in traditional comm space. And the brands in the UK at the time were very obsessed with Twitter and Facebook incorporation into campaigns. Sorry, yawning love. Want a Red Bull? There's a couple of behind the door. So, so, what they were doing is they were very interested in how do you incorporate people from a word of mouth point of view. We've spoken about how in traditional PR, you spoke to one journalist who then could communicate to tens of thousands of people, millions of people via newspapers, radio and TV. And that was the best way to incorporate spread around your message. So you told a good PR story, you got some journalists drunk, they published a story, ta-da, brand was a huge success. But how do you incorporate things like social media into a campaign? Very important. So there was this whole thing about bloggers and we even got like some My City by Night representation in the house. And there were these pockets of influencers and individuals who'd started blogs and they created a bit of success in the online space and they didn't necessarily know what to do with that. And like Alex said, brands were coming to you, wanting to you to post your content and share your stories. And in 2010, Nando's would traditionally, they would just post their now famous posters in newspapers. So they'd pay for the advertising space, there'd be some kind of breaking news or some uh, topical trend, they would make a poster and they'd buy the ad space in the newspaper and then that would get pushed out. And that's how the reach and awareness would, would take place. So in 2010 we went to Nando's and said, listen, you guys should stop dicking around with spending money on publishing in the newspapers, you should rather pay us, right? And then, what we can do is we can see the content to people who have the ability to spread your message far and wide. Completely different tactic, but let's give it a go. <laughs> so they said to us, listen, we have this poster, we're totally going to abuse you because you need to prove your worth, obviously, and we're like the best brand in the world. So we're going to leverage off you and see what you can do with your network. And they gave us a poster called WTF Juju Lol. And at the time, Julius wanted to shut down the Twitters, quote unquote. And that piece of content did so incredibly well. I mean, it was a Friday afternoon, most of you guys already on the beach, getting high, doing whatever you do down in Cape Town on a Friday afternoon. And we were a little bit skeptical, like this content isn't going to work because it's not going to be seen by the right people. But fortunately, there were people like Alex, there were people like um, Hurricane Vanessa, and then there were like Two Oceans Vile and a few other people. Sent the poster to them, I posted it on my, one of my own personal blogs, and over that 24 hour period, we experienced 7,000 unique eyeballs onto that piece of content. And we went back to them and said, listen, this is the importance of, at the time it didn't have a name, like a fancy name, like influencer marketing. It was just a, let's work with bloggers and online folk. That was the official term. And from there, they really started buying into that. And for the next three years when we worked with Nando's in particular, we didn't spend a cent on media seeding content. We used other activation and online integration elements to spread content. And the beautiful thing was a few months later, there was a video parody spoofing Sal C and the use of Trevor Noah. So Trevor Noah was like the new CEO of, of Sal C. 
And then what Nando's did was they created an ad called the CEO, the Chicken Excellence Officer. And uh, this just proves to you that sometimes things get horribly cocked up, no pun intended with chicken and cock. See what I did there? Da da da. Not only do I do heavy chef, I do bar mitzvahs and weddings. Um, but no bristles though, no bristles allowed. Um, I digress. So the interesting thing was like sometimes we get so caught up in like doing things wrong online and then having like this complete meltdown, like you spoke about the community manager from Bic, that poor person must have had the worst 24 hours of their lives. I mean that person actually hanged themselves three days later. Jokies. <laughs> got worried there because everyone was like, fuck, I tweeted that community manager. I said, you motherfucker, you should kill yourself, and they did. Oh. That emoticon with like the two balloons. Okay, no one died. I hope. And if you did, I'm sorry. But the point is, is that I lost my point completely. I just went to another place there. So, sometimes happens. Okay? So the interesting thing was, Cool. Mass talkability, content, salsi, chicken ripple, that kind of thing. And we posted that online, point being that sometimes things don't go right and dramas will end up helping you out at some stage. So we posted this piece of content online, we were testing the YouTube links, is it live, is it working, client was a little bit stressed even though they were the risky kind of Nando's vibe, they were just like, oh we're not sure about the seeding content on YouTube and what the vibe is. And then Matt Buckland's wife actually picked it up and she tweeted the link. And the next minute, Cape Town Girl was all over it like a rash. Ah! There was this amazing salsi spoof from Nando's and now it's gone! It's, now it's gone, the video's gone back to private. WTF is going down, people. Oh, is the agency in trouble? She was one of those people. So if I'd hang myself three days later, not being a huge international global success, man of mystery. <laughs> Jerkies. Um, she was the one that sparked a lot of that conversation. Like, what happened to that content? Where did it go? And then we said to the client, you can't just privatize things, like you put it out there. So now the people want to know. And this very superficial, snobby Cape Townian girl, she wants to know. And she's got some very high demanding purchases of your product, of your chicken. So let's give the people what they want. Let's give them the chicken content. And obviously made it go live, and then within three or four days, there were 100,000 unique views of that piece of content. And we never seen engagement in the South African context as much as we did during that process. A year later, online, Nando's Last Dictator, one million views in four days. So it just, it's been an interesting journey to see the growth and the evolution of the South African landscape. I mean, today they released the social essay stats and there's like 13 million people on Facebook. Uh, Instagram grew by like 133% from like 1.7 million people to 2.2. 75% of stats are made up. <laughs> I'm just rattling numbers. <laughs> to make me sound more intellectual. But that's the interesting thing, is like, we're in a space now where stuff continues to grow and there's more access to different channels. And yes, this is a very influencer-specific conversation, but it's important to identify as a brand, to identify those heroes within your different networks. Because those are the people that are ultimately gonna champion you. Do you know anyone using Snapchat? You do? Because it's Cape Town. Everyone here is an early adopter. <laughs> But the point is, is like, it's understanding what is going to be the next, next big thing and what isn't. And that's what we're always trying to figure out. Like, if someone's massive on Instagram today, are they going to be valuable? Are they going to be part of your brand engagement strategy and your focus? And also, the, the, the like, landscape has changed from a, from a purely, let me try and abuse you for free PR point of view, for us to finally get the message across to brands that influencers, if you're working with them from an editorial point of view, they deserve to be paid. They're not there like a publishing house or a magazine or a newspaper to attend events and they're not, they, they're not getting a salary like a journalist would. And that's why like, I feel like I'm a hippie or a tree hugger saying, they are blogger rights, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> they are influencer rights. Amen. Hallelujah, brothers and sisters. But that, I think that is the hugest differentiator is that publishing houses have budgets to pay people to be journalists. 
Bloggers are doing this and they've built a passion from something that they love. And the reason why you're targeting them and engaging with them is because you want their audience and you want access to that audience. So if you want that motherfucking access, motherfucking pay. Hooray. Cool. But ultimately, influencers are just another media channel. This is really looking at commoditizing influencers, but they really are just another media channel. And if you work with influencers, they're not going to give you the best value by throwing a press release at them or throwing some crappy content and expecting them to actually do something with that or make your crappy content go viral. You need to have remarkable content, you need to see it to the right people, and then you need to lead to a conversion way in which you can look at creating some kind of commercial value. So if you're working with influencers, you have to look at incorporating media spend into that. We've got it horribly wrong in the South African digital landscape. We have no problem spending 30% of a budget on TV production for TV ads and then putting 70% into media. But online, for some reason, we all don't want to spend money on production. If you're spending 100 grand making a video for online, then spend another 300 grand putting media behind that. And all we're doing in a lot of contexts is we're taking content from overseas and repurposing it and then just forcing it onto YouTube. PNG is my absolute best. They're going to find like a commercial with Spaniards. Because if you can find a dark enough Spaniard, we can kind of get away with being colored, my bra. <laughs> Nay, man, you got a fucking dead rough. Nay, I've got hidden shoulders. Like that's what I come across when I'm watching PNG commercials. Like whether I'm being interrupted on pre-rolls or I'm being interrupted on my favorite TV show. Like those are clearly Spaniards. But suddenly we've converted them into fucking colors. Sweet. Hey, that's why you gotta love having colors in the audience. You know what I say? I would much rather cast colors into my ads because they're the perfect balance in South Africa. Everyone finds colors funny. Black people find colors funny, white people find colors funny, colors find colors funny. White people, not funny. <laughs> when I talk in this accent, not funny. No laughs, a lot of anger. Okay? <laughs> but as soon as I drop the colored accent, boom, everyone's a crowd pleaser. Duh. Radio, TV, blogs. I was talking talking about it earlier, trying to imagine when TV was first launched and how people like, there's those stories from like your parents and stuff about TV launched and there was maybe like five minutes of TV and the rest of the time everyone just gathered around and watched the test pack. Oh my, oh, oh. <laughs> Jeez, there was some crazy shit just like, look at that hashtag, hugs, hugs not drugs. It's my pocket. So all forms of channels they were built around the content first and foremost. We know this. We know that it was the content that brought the audiences in. Whether people were listening to stories on the radio of actual like drama series and all that audio journey to TV having a bit of content and about eight hours of test pattern. And the same with blogs. The reason why blogs and online influencers became successful was because they had cool stuff to say. They had something different. They had a piss, a piss take of the media and marketing industry. They had a proudly South African message. They had a general news and a vibe about people getting high and living the good lives in Cape Town. Okay? So these things were built on something. And then advertising came along and it interrupted it. And interruption doesn't work in this age of digital disruption. Because we know that eventually we'll get to a stage where banners aren't good enough.